seduction. Now we are going to talk about other employee types of expenses. These are some of the ones that, are, that have been listed. Um, special clothing or uniform. It has to be something that is really specific to that job. So for an example, if you go and you buy in a suit to go to work in, that is not going to be something that is a special uniform. But if you were, um, like, say, a firefighter or an ambulance driver or something like that, then you would have a special uniform, and that would be something that is deductible. Um, union dues, professional expenses, so these will be things like your licensing expenditures to the state, when you go and you get CPE hours, that kind of thing. Um, if you pay to go to a convention it, to learn in the same field that you're already in, that would be the kind of things that are professional expenses. Also, job hunting expenses. This is all on slide um, 48. Job hunting expenses. These are expenses where you are seeking employment basically in the same profession. So, when, and these can be things like um, printing costs, professional counseling, travel to do job interviews, all those things are considered to be expenses incurred in trying to get a job, and those are deductible. However, if you are trying to get your first job, that is not deductible, okay? You have to actually already be in that profession. So since you all are students, when you go and you try to get your first job as an accountant, those expenses are not going to be something that's deductible because you are not in that profession yet. Um, another thing that's listed, to me this is a little bit out of order, I wouldn't really put this here, educator expenses. This is an above the line deduction um, and it's only for um, elementary and high school teachers and it's only $250 a year. So where do the rest of these items show up on a return? You know, where, where would these be reported as a deduction? Well, if someone is self-employed, obviously, you know, this, this, or this, these would all be reported on Schedule C. So special clothing, union dues and professional expenses, those are all going to be things related to your business and are going to be reported on Schedule C, basically. Job hunting fees, that's always going to be reported as an itemized deduction. Okay? So if you're talking about someone um, who's an employee, basically, then all the top four, special clothing, union dues, and professional expenses, and job hunting in the same profession are all going to be itemized deductions, right? Subject to that 2% two, two limit. And one of your taxpayers on your 1040 assignment has some of these expenses. Educator expenses are always above the line deductions for everybody. But it's a very small deduction because you only get $250 a year. So we talked about this, maybe it wasn't last week, maybe it was the week before when we first started talking about Chapter 9. And we said, okay, if somebody is self-employed, their business expenses are going to be reported on Schedule C, right? Okay, now what about if someone is employed? So they're an employee. Well, 
it depends, right, on whether the expenses are reimbursed or unreimbursed. Okay, we're going to talk about this slide in a minute, but I'm going to discuss this first. Reimbursed or unreimbursed. So if you have expenses that are unreimbursed, then all these expenses are going to be itemized. <laughs> itemized, subject to the 2% floor. Right? And these would be things like your, your uniform for your job, your professional expenses, your union dues, things that we just saw on the previous slide. Now, what about if they are reimbursed? Now, it depends on if they are reimbursed subject to an accountable plan, okay, then there's basically nothing to report. No income and no deduction. So this is when the employer pays you back. So if it's done according to an accountable plan, no income to the employee, but no deduction either. If it's done according to a non-accountable plan, this is the bad result. This is when they have to include the reimbursement in income, and the deduction is itemized, subject to that 2% limit. So we talked about this, I know it's been a while, but a little bit ago. So now what we're going to talk about is, okay, what's the difference between an accountable plan and a non-accountable plan? So I'm going to skip past this and we'll come back to retirement plans in just a second. Starts on page slide 52, okay? So, slide 54 says, a plan must require adequate accounting to the employer for the expense that's reimbursed. And, and any excess reimbursements must be returned to the employer. So these are the two requirements under an accountable plan. There must be adequate accounting and there must be a return of excess reimbursements. So what does adequate accounting mean? Slide 55, you have to submit a record with your receipts to your employer, that's option, option one. Option two is to use a per diem rate. So the IRS puts out guidelines, they're updated every year, and they say, okay, if you're doing work in this location, we will allow you a per diem rate of $500 a day. That is your rate for lodging and travel expenses. Um, now, of course, if you look up this sheet, it's not going to list Nacogdoches, Texas on it, okay? It, it will probably list uh, Northeast Texas or maybe just East Texas or maybe, you know, surrounding Houston areas. You know, I don't know. It will be very broad. It will not say Nacogdoches, Texas. Um, but it will give you what the per diem rate is in that location. So adequate accounting can be either submitting the actual receipts or using a per diem allowance. If a per diem allowance is used, you don't actually have to submit receipts. Again, if we're take, doing this under the accountable plan, there's nothing for the employee to report. It's a wash. And, the, and by the way, the employer decides if an accountable plan is going to be used, not the employee. Kind of stinks because the tax <coughs> consequences are the same, really, to the employer. But, the empl but to the employee, it matters greatly whether we're using an accountable plan or a non-accountable plan. Okay. 
These are some things that should be on records. The amount of the expense, the time and place of the travel or entertainment, if that's what you're looking at. The business purpose of the expense, the business relationship of the taxpayer. So again, let's say you're looking at, you took a client out to dinner and your employer does not have an accountable plan and you get reimbursed for it. So what does that mean? You have to include the reimbursement in income, right? And you're going to have to take an atomized deduction on Schedule A. So let's take a look here. <laughs> this is on slide 57 that says what should be on the records. We'll come back to this in a second. Form 2106. So if we're looking at Form 2106 here on the board, this is the form that um, we use for employee business expenses and reimbursements. And as you all know by now, you will have to fill out this form for your assignment. And honestly, this form, this form is pretty self-explanatory. You can read the categories of the items up here on the left. Vehicle expense, parking fees, tolls, travel expenses, or other business expenses, meals and entertainment, and then you enter your total down. If you had any reimbursements, you would enter that here. And then we calculate our total expenses and you can see right here, enter the total on Schedule A, line 21. So now let's go to Schedule A. Line 21, unreimbursed employee expenses, right here. And if you'll notice, everything in this category, Unreimbursed employee expenses, tax fees, <coughs> other expenses, all that. This is subject to the 2% floor. You can see here with line 26, subject to the 2% floor. With a traditional IRA, it works the opposite. 
you get a deduction when you put the money in. But when you take it out after you retire, you pay taxes. Either way, you're going to pay taxes. With a Roth IRA, you pay the taxes now. With a traditional IRA, you pay the taxes later. So a lot of young people just starting out will choose to do a Roth IRA because you'll be in a lower tax bracket. I would rather pay the taxes now when I'm in a low tax bracket as opposed to later. Well, we don't really know what's going to happen. Right? Nobody can see the future. And you definitely can't see the future, you know, 50 years from now. But, you know, okay, I'm in a 10-15% bracket this year, so I'm going to put money into my IRA this year in hopes that when I retire I'll be in a higher bracket and I'm saving tax money. Another option for retirement it's called a co-plan. This is on slide 51, K-E-O-G-H. It could be pronounced differently. If there are any finance people in here that know how it's actually pronounced, that's good. But a co-plan is used for people that are self-employed. So if you're self-employed, you can set up a retirement plan under a co-plan. These are really similar to traditional IRAs as far as the deduction on your return and you pay taxes when it goes out. There are a little bit of different limits for it. I don't actually think it says what the limits are in the book. Um, yeah, it doesn't. And then there's some other options that are listed here on this slide, a 401k, a set plan, or a simple plan. Um, the book really mentions, it says, for information, see chapter 19. So obviously, this is not covered in this chapter. And I don't really know a lot about it. Um, I'll tell you that tax people, anytime they see something related to, it's called deferred compensation, or something related to retirement plans, something along these lines, there are experts in the tax field that only deal with this. Um, so it out. There are maybe a handful of people in Dallas, uh, more, more in Houston, but not many people do this. So the ones that do make a lot of money because there aren't many people who specialize in this. Most tax people don't know a lot about it. The rules are really complicated. So, including myself, I don't know much about it. I know a little bit, but not much. are subject to 2%. I showed you what that looks like on Schedule A. There are some miscellaneous itemized deductions that are not going to be subject to the 2%. Um, these are the ones that are subject to the 2%. And I just showed you what it looks like on Schedule A. The big one that we just talked about, unreimbursed employee expenses, Section 212 expenses. Remember, these are your expenses related to, you know, uh, for profit, like investment, that kind of thing. If it's for rents and royalties, remember it will not be an itemized deduction. It's going to go on Schedule E. Tax return prep fees, hobby expenses, other types of investment expenses. Now there are a few uh, miscellaneous itemized deductions that are not subject to the 2% floor. Terminated annuity payments, gambling losses to the extent of winnings, and impairment related expenses of handicapped individuals. This is on slide 62. So let's look at an example here. This is example 50.
we have a taxpayer who has an AGI of $40,000. He has gambling losses of $2,200. He has tax return prep fees of $500. He has unreimbursed employee <coughs> expenses. Specifically, it says it is transportation expenses. Of $600. <coughs> he has professional dues and subscriptions. of $360, and he has a safe deposit box rental of $90. Okay, so we want to determine um, what this miscellaneous itemized deduction is going to be. So, out of these, which are not subject to the 2% limit? Sure. Sorry, gambling losses. So if he's deducting $2,200 $2, of gambling losses, what does he also have to do? Somewhere else on the return. Okay, on page one. Include gambling income and miscellaneous income. $2,200 of it, at least because you can only deduct gambling losses to the extent you have gambling income. So he is also including $2,200 in his miscellaneous income on page one of his return. Probably maybe more, okay? Because you cannot deduct losses for gambling unless you have the gains to back it up. So he's reporting $2,200 of gain. He's getting a $2,200 itemized deduction. All right, so we, are all the rest of these going to be subject to the 2% limit? Yes. So these two are going to be unreimbursed employee fees. A safe deposit box rental is considered to be an investment expense. Tax prep fees are tax prep fees. So these are all subject to that 2% which we saw on Schedule A. So the first thing we want to do, um, let's add up all these fees right here, which equals fifteen fifty. Now what do we need to do? That's right. Multiply. Figure out basically what our two percent limit is going to be. Right? So forty percent, forty thousand dollars, which is our AGI, times two percent equals eight hundred dollars. So what do we do with the eight hundred? To figure out our deduction, what do we need to do? That is right. Subtract so eight hundred from the fifteen fifty and this will get us our deduction. Seven hundred and fifty dollars plus twenty two hundred twenty two hundred is twenty nine fifty miscellaneous itemized deduction. Seven fifty plus twenty two. Everyone see how that works? Okay. Okay, that's it for this chapter. So we'll move on to chapter ten. One second.